After successfully completing the Starship full-stack wet dress rehearsal, Starbase is now gearing up for the much-anticipated 33-engine Super Heavy Static Fire Test. According to SpaceX's Vice President of Flight Reliability, Bill Gerstenmaier, a lot of work must be completed before that much-anticipated test. Teams at Starbase are currently finalizing those works, and SpaceX CEO Elon Musk recently shared a photo of the giant Super Heavy vehicle getting ready for the static fire test. Two second-generation Raptor engines of Booster 7 were replaced on January 27 and 28. The third Raptor was swapped on Thursday, February 2. SpaceX may static fire test those three new Raptors in the coming days before moving on to the 33-engine test, or they may move directly to the 33-engine test. Testing all 33 Raptors at once is necessary to ensure the vehicle and the launch mount can withstand such a large force and that all engines are in good condition. SpaceX has never ignited more than 14 of Super Heavy's 33 Raptor engines at once. During Booster 7's 14-engine static fire on November 14, the prototype may have produced up to 32 meganewtons of thrust. That was only about 8 meganewtons less than the thrust produced by NASA's Space Launch System rocket when it launched from the Kennedy Space Center on November 16. When Booster 7 ignites all 33 engines for the first time, its maximum thrust could reach 76 meganewtons, beating the next most powerful rocket in history, the Soviet N-1, which produced 45 meganewtons of thrust when it launched in the 1960s and 70s. The success of the 33-engine test is far from guaranteed, and the worst possible failure mode could almost destroy the orbital launch site, delaying the Starship's orbital flight for months. If the test goes as planned, Starship 24 will be restacked atop Booster 7, leaving only the launch license to be worked on before SpaceX can set the launch date. FAA will only issue the license once SpaceX successfully completes all pre-launch tests and address all the issues raised in the FAA environmental review. Elon Musk tweeted last month that SpaceX could be ready for an orbital launch as soon as late February. Booster 7's companion, Starship 24, was sent to the Rocket Garden on January 26, after successfully completing the wet dress rehearsal test. Thereafter, teams removed all six lifting points installed on the nose cone of the ship and mounted stainless steel plates to cover the holes they had left behind. Thermal protection tile installation over the covering plates is currently underway. Ship 24 is almost ready for the orbital test flight. The vehicle will be returned to the launch site after SpaceX engineers complete final checks and Booster 7 successfully completes its 33-engine test. Elon Musk recently revealed that SpaceX might eventually build an expendable version of the Starship vehicle. At 120 meters tall, Starship is the largest, tallest, heaviest, and most powerful launch vehicle in history. In the past, SpaceX claimed that reusable Starship vehicles could lift up to 100 tons to low Earth orbit. In a recent website update, the company says that with certain optimizations, Starship can launch up to 150 tons to low Earth orbit while still recovering the ship and booster for reuse. The website also mentions that an expendable version of the rocket could launch up to 250 metric tons to low Earth orbit in a single launch. Musk clarified in a tweet that such expendable ships may or may not fly, but it is an option SpaceX is considering. Musk likely means that SpaceX may or may not decide to develop a Starship upper stage custom built for expendable missions. Such ships do not need thermal protection tiles and flaps, and do not need to carry additional fuel for atmospheric re-entry and landing burns. This will significantly reduce the ship's total mass, allowing SpaceX to launch much heavier payloads into low Earth orbit. In a 2019 tweet, Musk mentioned that SpaceX could develop a lightened version of the Starship that can carry probes to the outer solar system. In a single launch, Starship could also send giant telescopes into space, enabling astronomical observations. SpaceX's contract to use Starship to return NASA astronauts to the moon revolves around a depot ship variant that will store propellant in orbit, which is not meant for return to Earth. The first few Starship moon landers may also be expendable. Compared to a lunar Starship intended to return to Earth, an expendable vehicle can carry much heavier cargo to the lunar surface, along with astronauts. Moreover, SpaceX's Starbase factory is already building multiple expendable Starship prototypes. Starships 26 and 27 feature no thermal protection tiles and flaps, making them impossible to recover or reuse. They'll probably be used to evaluate Starship technologies like orbital refilling and cryogenic fluid management. In short, the fact that SpaceX is advertising Starship's expendable capabilities confirms that the company already has extensive plans to build variants of Starship that are either fully expendable or can only be reused in orbit. Parts likely meant for the Starship water deluge system were spotted being prefabricated at the Starbase Sanchez site lately. 
SpaceX shipped a large collection of hardware, including giant deluge manifolds, plumbing, a booster transport stand, and storage tanks from Florida to Starbase on January 22. Following a two-week voyage, the barge reached port of Brownsville on February 3. The construction of the deluge may begin as soon as the hardware arrives at Starbase. Some kind of foundation work is currently ongoing near the Starbase orbital launch tower, probably for installing the deluge system hardware shipped from Florida. Please check out my previous video to learn more about SpaceX's Starship water deluge system plans. Link in the description. The nose cone and payload bay assembly of Starship 27 was recently moved out of the high bay after stacking. The payload bay section of Ship 27 has a Starlink satellite dispenser installed, so the ship is likely to carry second-generation Starlink satellites into orbit. Several Gen 2 Starlink spacecraft have already arrived at Starbase. A Starship Quick Disconnect panel was recently spotted at SpaceX's Massey's test facility, located several kilometers away from Starbase. Musk has previously mentioned that SpaceX plans to build a rocket test facility at this location. We may soon witness Starship pre-launch tests at this site. Now, let's discuss some of the biggest updates in the world of science and technology from the past week. SpaceX launched two Starlink missions two days apart from separate launch sites, marking the seventh and eighth overall launches for the company in 2023. The first mission, dubbed Starlink Group 26, lifted off from Vandenberg Space Force Base in California on Tuesday, January 31. The mission carried 49 Starlink Internet satellites and a rideshare space tug into space. The Falcon 9's first stage came back to Earth about eight and a half minutes after liftoff, touching down on a SpaceX drone ship positioned in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of California. Meanwhile, the upper stage continued hauling the 50 payloads into low Earth orbit. Approximately 58 minutes after liftoff, it deployed the rideshare space tug Ion Satellite Carrier Vehicle 9. The 49 Starlink satellites followed 20 minutes later, successfully completing Falcon 9's 200th launch. The Ion Satellite Carrier Orbital Transfer Vehicle, developed and operated by the Italian company D-Orbit, features a customizable dispenser that hosts CubeSats of various sizes. Payloads on the January 31 mission included a solar sail designed to speed up satellite deorbiting, a prototype of a satellite deployment mechanism, a computer developed by Swiss students, and a memorial payload containing cremated human remains. After separating from Falcon 9's upper stage, the satellite carrier vehicle released its payloads individually into various orbits. The second Falcon 9 mission of the past week, dubbed Starlink Group 53, was launched from Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center on Thursday, February 2. The mission carried 53 Starlink satellites into a 530-kilometer orbit, inclined 43 degrees to the equator. After separating from the upper stage, the rocket's first stage touched down on a drone ship stationed in the Atlantic Ocean, marking its fifth successful launch and landing. Thursday's launch was the fourth this year that SpaceX devoted to Starlink Internet satellites. The company has launched more than 3,800 Starlink satellites to date, and the constellation will keep expanding. All Starlink satellites to date have flown aboard Falcon 9 rockets, but in the future, SpaceX will rely on its Starship vehicle to loft the larger second-generation Starlink spacecraft. The next Falcon 9 launch, which will carry the 4,500-kilogram Spanish communications satellite, Amazonas Nexus, into a geostationary orbit, is scheduled for liftoff from Cape Canaveral on February 5. The hypersonic air-breathing weapon concept vehicle, jointly developed by DARPA and the U.S. Air Force, completed yet another successful flight test. Upon being released from a Boeing B-52 Stratofortress aircraft, the test vehicle's solid rocket booster ignited, propelling the craft to a speed at which its scramjet engine ignited. Once in flight, the vehicle traveled more than 556 kilometers at speeds greater than Mach 5 and reached altitudes higher than 18 kilometers. DARPA did not give a location or date for the test, stating only that it took place in January 2023. Scramjet engines use high vehicle speed to forcibly compress incoming air through an inlet diffuser into the combustor. After combustion, the products are accelerated through a convergent-divergent nozzle to hypersonic speeds. As they have no mechanical means of compression, scramjets cannot start from a standstill like turbojet engines. Also, they generally do not achieve sufficient compression until accelerated to supersonic speed by a solid rocket booster after dropping from the carrier aircraft. Scramjet engines are designed to run on readily available hydrocarbon fuel, and since they use air for combustion, they do not have to carry the added weight of an onboard oxidizer. These key attributes allow for a safe, efficient, and tactically sized long-range hypersonic weapon. 
By traveling at very high speeds, hypersonic weapons can reach their targets more quickly than conventional missiles, allowing them to evade defense systems. The DARPA U.S. Air Force hypersonic test vehicle made its first successful flight in September 2021, and further testing was carried out in March and July 2022. The fourth and final test conducted last month marked the completion of the hypersonic air-breathing weapon concept program, which met all of its primary goals. DARPA will now use the data gathered from the flight tests to build and fly a hypersonic attack cruise missile that will be acquired and used by the U.S. military. NASA's Perseverance rover has dropped the final sample tube onto the Martian surface, thus completing humanity's first sample depot on another world. Perseverance touched down on Mars in February 2021, with the primary goal of searching for evidence of ancient microbial life and gathering samples of the Martian environment. The rover has brought 43 titanium sample tubes to Mars, 38 of which will be filled with Martian dust and rock samples. The remaining five tubes are witness tubes, which will be used to measure the cleanliness of the sampling system. The sample and witness tubes will be returned to Earth for investigation using instruments too large and complex to send to Mars. Based on the architecture of the Mars sample return campaign, Perseverance would deliver samples to a future robotic lander, which will carry a rocket to blast the samples off the Martian surface. A spacecraft orbiting the Red Planet would capture the sample container and return it safely to Earth, perhaps as early as 2033. But in case Perseverance gets stuck somewhere, the samples dropped on the Martian surface will be collected by a pair of helicopters that will be arriving with the lander, and they will then be transported to the return vehicle. Perseverance dropped its first sample tube on December 21, and the tenth and final sample tube on January 29. The titanium tubes were deposited on the surface in an intricate zigzag pattern, with each sample being about 5 to 15 meters apart from one another to ensure that the location of each tube could be precisely mapped and that they could be safely recovered. Each sample tube weighs nearly 57 grams and has a white exterior coating to protect them from the sun's heat, which could alter the chemical composition of the samples. The sample return mission will help to answer some of the most fundamental questions regarding Mars and the possibility of life there. Now that its depot work is complete, the rover will begin a new phase of its science mission, called the Delta Top Campaign. The mission involves investigating the upper reaches of the ancient river Delta, responsible for bringing water, rocks, and sediments into Jezero Crater billions of years ago. The Ingenuity Mars helicopter, operating alongside the Perseverance rover, completed its 41st Martian flight on January 27, covering 183 meters in just 109 seconds. Ingenuity's 41st flight exceeds the technology demonstration manifest by eightfold, as the helicopter was originally tasked with just five demo flights. As part of its extended mission, the helicopter is now helping scientists look for interesting scientific targets and find the best route for perseverance to navigate the cratered and rocky terrain of Jezero. The 1.8-kilogram helicopter has flown for 4,060 seconds to date, covering 8.2 kilometers. Thank you for joining me for this week's science news and starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.